Welcome to Target Market Insights, a multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing show. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if you're enjoying this show, you have to do me one quick favor. Leave us a five-star rating and review. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, today we're going to be talking to Neil Bauer. Neil Bauer is a technologist who is universally known in the real estate circles as the mad scientist of multifamily. Besides being one of the most in-demand speakers in commercial real estate, Neil is also a data guru, a process freak, and an outsourcing expert. Now, Neil treats his $250 million multifamily portfolio as an ongoing experiment in efficiency and optimization. Now, the mad scientist lives by two mantras. His first mantra is that we can only manage what we can measure. His second mantra is that data beats gut feel by a million miles. With that said, let's welcome on the show, Neil Bauer. Thanks for having me on the show again, John. It's a pleasure to be back. Absolutely. As Neil alluded to, Neil was a guest back on episode 99. What Neil may not even know is that is actually our most popular episode the last time I checked. It's been a minute since I checked, but It was the number one episode, number one downloaded episode the last time we checked. So you definitely want to check that out. Now, a lot has changed since that time back in, I believe it was January 2019, where we talked about the hottest markets for the upcoming year. Why don't we just kind of pause for a second for those who didn't check that out, that episode out and are not familiar with you. Why don't you take a minute and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm a uh, recovering technologist. Um, I, you know, uh, got into real estate in reverse, um, was in a technology company, was running it, 400 employees, and we decided to build our own campus from scratch. And so most people start with a single family rental. I started with a $6 million campus that had to be built from scratch. So uh, trial by fire, really, uh, I really was terrified and then ended up really enjoying it and, and saw the power of real estate and then saw the power of the tax benefits that we were re- receiving, which were truly insane for a company that was making 30, 40% net margins. And, and we were paying too much in taxes. And all of a sudden we were paying a lot less. And it's like, wow, this, this stuff is, is crazy. This, this, is, this is not a level playing field. You know, real estate people are not on the same playing field as everybody else. So we, we love that. And then both my CEO and I, uh, you know, started basically part-time real estate careers. I bought 10 single families in California and I used data science and metrics to identify a small city in California called Madeira and had an in- incredible success buying, you know, 10 units, 10, 10 single families, which is the most you can buy for single family loans. And then, then I took that as a case study and I started to build a data metric system around those um, because I'd been successful in the use of metrics and developed it into a course called Location Magic, which is now taken by about 10,000 people a year. And Location Magic allows you to use the power of metrics to identify the best cities and best neighborhoods in the United States. So once again, about 10,000 people a year take that course. There's about 30 or 40,000 people that are using the tools that are in that course. The course is free. It's meant to be free. It's meant to be extended by people. If you understand what open source means, that's what the course is. Listen, so Neil has some great resources available. I believe Location Magic is available on multifamilyu.com, correct? That is correct. So you go to multifamily.com, you click learn. It's a two and a half hour course. You'll watch me teaching it. So you'll see a video of me, but you'll also see my screen. And I'll take you through every single step. I'll explain all the metrics and why they matter and when to make an exception. And then I'll tell you how to use a simple Excel spreadsheet to just plug in numbers and get thumbs up and thumbs down. And for our loyal listeners, you know how big I am on finding the best places to invest. When we launched this show, it was all about finding the right markets and submarkets. So Neil has some great data. I've checked it out myself. It's great stuff to look into. So make sure you check that out. If you are looking for a little bit of help figuring out the best places to invest and understanding the criteria that someone like Neil uses to identify those locations. Now, Neil, when we had you on the show last year, we talked about the best places to invest for 2019. And, uh, you know, I know a few markets really jumped out. We talked about, you know, out west in Utah, Salt Lake City in particular, I believe Provo were Mm -hmm. a couple of markets we talked heavily about. And then Mm -hmm. in Florida, 
we talked about, you know, kind of that I-4 corridor, Orlando, Tampa, and other markets. A lot, a lot has happened since that time frame. Uh, Talk yes. to me about kind of how those markets fared. Let's let's just say up to COVID nineteen. How were they faring based on where what you loved about them? You know, maybe fifteen, sixteen months ago. And then where do you see things shifting as we kind of go forward in this post COVID nineteen era? So uh, those markets did really well after we spoke about them in January. So up to up uh, up until Feb twenty twenty, those markets were extremely strong. Provo was very strong. So was Orlando, Jacksonville, that entire I four corridor in Florida. Uh, was very strong. And then some of the other markets that, that I'm hard on have done well, like Phoenix and Tucson have been very strong markets. And so is Atlanta. Atlanta is a really, really powerful market because it is the only uh, market in the U.S. that is on balance. People's salaries and what they're paying for rent and paying for homes are in balance, which is, at one, once again, the only metro in the U.S. that has that balance. Everywhere else, people are paying a little bit more than they should. So, um, so until in the pre-COVID world, I think that we were right on track with those cities using the benchmarks that I provide, which is you know population growth, income growth, home price growth, job growth, and crime reduction. Those are the five city-level metrics that we use, and they are, once again they're on multifamilyu.com. That's multifamily you know, followed by the letter u.com. Click on learn, take the three-hour course, and it'll explain how to to find cities. But I have to be blunt with you. I have to be really honest. My entire system doesn't matter for the next two months. I don't think you should use it. I don't think anyone should use it. I don't think anyone should use any kind of systems because I think right now the way to describe the marketplace in the month of April, May, and possibly June is that we have a, we're trying to drive through fog, right? And no matter what kind of headlight Neil Bawa provides, that headlight is not going to get you through the fog. Headlights, you know, just reflect light back at you, right? We're in fog and this fog is insanely thick. So it's very, very difficult to tell what the impact will be. Florida might have some phenomenal long-term, you know, focus, but isn't Florida also at risk for COVID-19 because it has a large number of seniors, right? It has a lot of people that are, isn't Florida also very tied to the travel industry? Orlando and Miami and, and, Fort, and, and uh, Fort Lauderdale are extremely tied to the travel economy, to the tourism economy. Fort Lauderdale is tied to the cruise ship economy where 100% of the revenue has been lost. So now you have these, these cities and these states that have very, very strong uh, underlying fundamentals that are taking insane hits either because they have an older population or because they have a tourism-related population. So bottom line is that this is a true black swan event, and it it, it threatens at this point to basically just completely upset our apple cart in in terms of the way that we look at numbers and believe at numbers. Now, having said that, I don't believe that that phase lasts for more than 6 to 12 months. At this point, I think that a vaccine is likely to come in seven to eight months, not not 18 months, which is a normal process. They're, they are able to accelerate it. They're able to bend and break rules. So we get to it in eight months, which is, you know, maybe Feb of next year. But we can also have a cure. Cures are easier than, than vaccines. So I believe that we'll get to, you know, giving people a cure once they get to the hospital, you inject them with something and it, and it and prevents the deaths. And if that can happen and we get enough of those, then our economy can reopen. But for the moment, but for the moment, you have to study every metro to see how it's affected. Like, for example, let me give you an exa- another example, right? So Texas is a phenomenal Southeast market. You know, a lot of people believe in it. You know, more, more uh, Fortune 500 going there, highest population growth, you name it. I mean, there's, there's so many accolades that you can give Texas. But now Texan markets are hit with the worst oil collapse of all time, right? Even Houston's hit. Now, Houston's um, has, has, has adapted and even in the last 12 months where there was an oil crash underway, Houston still had the second highest job growth in the United States. So they managed to adapt, even though they lost a lot of oil jobs last year, they, they gained a lot of healthcare jobs, right? Houston's becoming a healthcare, uh, you know, a capital. Texas Medical Center is now the largest medical center in the world. And of course, will grow massively as a result of what happened with, with the virus. So 
I think you have to look at every metro now from an underlying and immediate fundamentals. Did the city get hit more because it was a tourism city? So anything, any city that is strongly related to tourism gets hit. You know, San Francisco is at the top of my list and so is Orlando, but Miami. I think tourism cities are going to see a massive impact for the next 12 months. Right. So it's it's actually cities like Chicago that will do better, because even though Chicago has some tourism, Chicago is really more seen as a banking center, an industrial center. It's more seen as a manufacturing center. It's the it's basically the capital of the Midwest. Right. Even though it's, you know, it's a city in Illinois. But if you look at that cluster of 10, 10 states, it's really their capital. Right. So cities with those kinds of underlying fundamentals are going to do better than cities that are. Um, are um, you know are tourism driven, right? Cities that are technology driven may be heard a lot less. So San Jose is a tech driven city. It is not a tourism city like San Francisco. It is going to outperform because technology hasn't been hit that hard. Tech companies are still hard at work. They're using Zoom just like we are. They're doing their thing. So now anything that's a technology center is going to do well. Like Seattle, I think is going to do well because it's a tech center. And, and so, so, you know, look at those advantages, right? So th those places will do well. And then look at political affiliations. This is a new deal because blue states are much more resistant to ending lockdowns than red states are. Red states are basically going to say, you know what? We're going to deal with some deaths. We, we're going to treat this like the flu. The flu does not shut down the United States. Uh, you know, car accidents don't shut down freeways in the U.S. We're just going to treat it as, you know, we'll do our best. We'll do random city by city shutdowns, but we're not shutting down our economy. The blue states are going to say, nope, you know, every time this thing flares up again, we're just going to shut our state back down because we don't want to lose any lives. So that's a new thing. That's a big deal now that at this point, as a as a real estate investor, you already wanted to invest in red states. You know, I'm I'm I live in a blue state. I'm a, I'm a Democrat, but I invest only in Republican states because of their their tenant laws, right? They're they're a lot friendlier to landlords. Now we have a new reason to invest. Those states are likely to see a lot less lockdown. For example, 42 states in the United States are in lockdown, but the eight states that are not in lockdown or only in partial lockdown are all Republican states. Right. So you see my point there. So these are new factors that matter today that did not matter 45 days ago. I think it's interesting, too, because there's so I mean, you gave a lot of information there. Right. And just to kind of recap some of it, um, we talked about, you know, understanding the, the cities and the markets themselves, what's going on in the cities and the markets. Um, you know, we talked about some of those initial things, looking at population growth income growth, looking at the housing market and other factors to really understand what is the strength of the economy? What's the strength mm -hmm. of that local market? Um, and I love your analogy, right? We're going through fog and no matter what kind of headlights you use, you're still going through fog. You know, it might help you see a little bit clearer, but at the end of the day, you're still going through fog. So we won't really know clearly, but just some of the factors to think about the technology. You know, one of the things when we look at markets, we talk about uh, industry diversification, you know, wanting to make sure that we are in an, a market where there's different industries so that if one takes a big hit, we're not completely, you know, collapsed or beholden to that negative impact. And for right. someone who lived in Detroit, when the automotive market went down working in the yeah. automotive industry, this hits home for me. And right. to your point, you look at a market like Chicago, where you have banking, you have, you know, packaged goods, you have different industries that are really taking it, that market's going to do okay. But you look at tourism, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, San Francisco and Miami, I was thinking about Las Vegas, you know, and there's been so Las much Vegas, interest Orlando. in Las Vegas, Orlando. Yeah, th these are going to get hit much harder than other cities like Jacksonville is not going to get hit because it is not considered to be a uh, tourism market. It's a military market and there's no decline in military revenue. Military revenue is exactly where it was 45 days ago. So markets that were were focused on the government sector are going to do a lot better today. Right. But generally, we, we, we are very hesitant to recommend the government sector. We're like, you know, that's a one trick pony. You know, but, you know, you go from having, you know, Republicans to Democrats and they cut the budget and then blah, blah, blah. Right. All that bad stuff happens. But today, in today's environment, Section 8 is king. Today's environment, government driven cities are king. Technology driven cities are king. And so things have really changed. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you these, these thumbs up and thumbs down. Technology, awesome, right? Red states are more likely to have less shutdowns. Anything that is tourism related is going to get hit. 
anything that is oil related is going to get hit. So these are new factors. On top of the other factors, those factors all matter because this thing either will go away in six months or it'll go away in 12 months. If we figure out how to do the dance well, the phase where we reopen the economy, I call it the dance. The phase that we are in right now, I call it the hammer, right? So we've been in the hammer now for about three or four weeks and we're gonna be in the hammer until May 20th. So at this point, there's almost universal agreement that May 20th is the magic date for the US when we reopen. And so May 21st onward, we are in the dance. If we learn how to do the dance well with the virus and be smart, like for example, reopen restaurants, but don't open baseball stadiums, right? Because there, your infection level coming out of a baseball game with 60,000 people in it is 50x what it could be in a restaurant. So you've got to be really smart about this, right? You've got to be very, very clever about how you do these sorts of things and, and figure out what is possible and what is not possible, right? So you want to reopen the domestic airlines, tell them not to have a, a, a center seat. You want to open your, your, you know, the economy back up, fine, we'll do it. But you can't have a center seat there. You can't have people sitting elbow to elbow. That's just a recipe for disaster. For five hours, I'm sitting with somebody, right, next to them. At least let me get a little bit of, you know, resistance. Don't allow anybody in an airport without masks. So a lot of it will be about how we do the dance well. But let me play worst case scenario and say we play the dance poorly. Even then, we'll get to that vaccine in Feb, right? So in March, the economy will go back to its true roots. It'll probably take a year. So you can't give up on things like population growth, job growth, income growth, household growth, crime reduction. Those will always matter because nobody's buying real estate for the next three or six months. You're buying it for five years, right? So they matter. But today, you've got to look at all these new factors that I talked about because those factors could matter because we could, maybe a vaccine doesn't come in eight months. Maybe it takes 18 months. Well, then you've got to live in a corona world. And so you've got you you got to be careful not to invest in a place that has a lot of oil. you got to be careful not to invest in a place that has a lot of tourism. So for me, much as I love Orlando, a big thumbs down for it. So let's jump into a couple of things. One, I want to clarify something just because I, I want to make sure people don't misinterpret what you said. I thought you did an excellent job of clarifying your statement, but it's one of those things where it's probably yeah. better to, to continue to press it than to just let it go. Um, from a political standpoint, we're not talking actual politics. This is just simply understanding the way things tend to go. And your point was blue states are more likely to go into shutdown than red states. Red states, uh, of course, being Republican states, are more likely to say, hey, look, let's keep the economy going. You know, if there's some collateral we'll take some damage, losses. If there's yeah. some collateral damage, you know, we'll, we'll try to help people the best we can. But we're not going to shut down the economy again to do that. The other thing I think we have to factor in is this is an election year. And mm -hmm. with a sitting Republican president, my guess, and I'm assuming you're in the same boat, it's in his best interest to do, in the, the current administration's best interest to do everything they can to get the economy going as quickly as possible while keeping people safe so they can right. manage the headlines, get through this. If they're pumping money into the economy or whatever they got to do to to stick this thing up and, and keep it straight, at least until they get into, you know, the election time frame, my gut tells me that's what they're going to do. How does that impact the way you look at some of these markets going into the balance of the year? So uh, you've got to look at what the government is doing, right? So you've got to look at that $2 trillion bill and see what is who's who stands to benefit. Like, for example, airlines, um, you know, where are they based out of? For example, Delta, I think, is an Atlanta hub, right? And mm -hmm. it has just received an astonishingly large amount of money. Essentially, its entire payroll for the next six months is funded by the federal government. Now, that's a big deal because a huge number of those employees are living in Atlanta Metro and stand to be direct beneficiaries of what essentially is a gift from the federal government, right? Let's be honest here, right? That money, the loans may, may come back and even if they if ever, ever, ever get paid back, it's gonna be years and years and years. People are still paying back loans from 2009, right? So bottom line is you've got to look at what the federal government is doing and see who is benefiting. So Atlanta actually is a double beneficiary. Firstly, because the largest infrastructure for the CDC happens to be in Atlanta and the CDC just received a massive billion dollar gift, right? So they're going to spread, you know, they're, they're going to be hiring people like nuts for the next, you know, year. They're, they're going to have as many people as they can possibly get that are on the healthcare side. So healthcare hubs are going to benefit a huge amount from the government money. $250 billion was for hospitals. So you want to buy real estate? 
why don't you look at buying near major hospital centers? In Texas, it's definitely the Texas Medical Center, right? Because te the Texas Medical Center in Houston is so big, it has its own zip code, right? That's the size of the place. Okay. So look at these large, massive hospital and research facilities around the United States and say, I'm going to go invest there. That's what matters because the government bailed those people out. The government is going to help them expand. And that's not a short process. A lot of people keep thinking this is two months. People stop thinking this is two months. You cannot fix a worldwide shutdown in two months. You cannot fix it in six months either, right? It may get better mentally in six months, but it's not going to be done. So you look at what happened with 9-11, John. After 9-11, for the next five years, the fastest growing vertical in the world was security companies. Anything that had to do with physical security, anything that had to do with digital security, five years of growth. So what happens this time? Anybody that the government bails out, anybody that the government is promoting gets a long-term growth trend. And I think this time, if I had to give it one word and say, you've got to look at this, it's anything health related because health's gonna to be top of mind for a long time. Old rich people are dying. Old rich people have the most lobbying power in America. They are going to pay, you know, they're gonna hire the right lobbies, they're gonna do the right things. Our healthcare infrastructure is going to grow massively, not just ours, but worldwide. So any healthcare hubs, that's where you wanna go. Love it. Healthcare hubs, where we want to focus our attention to. You started talking about Atlanta a little bit. We've talked about Texas Medical Center. Let's mm -hmm. just dive right into that. Coming out of COVID-19, what are some of the top markets we should be paying attention to? So Phoenix is another one, but but keep in mind, I, I don't want to use, say all of Phoenix, right? So there's portions of Phoenix that are very tied to medical tourism. Mesa is a great example because Mesa is a place where there's rows and rows of hospitals. There's like a street where on both sides of the street you have hospitals. And then you have something known as medical tourism where people come in and they stay for multiple months and their families go and live in the Airbnbs that are close by. Now, I don't, I don't want to say that they'll be living in those Airbnbs, but the medical tourism is going to continue. It's going to expand. And so, so that part of Mesa, which is this hospital row, is going to do really well. Tucson has one of those facilities, but there's areas as well. That's like a hospital row. Um, so Cleveland has one. Cincinnati has one. So that there's, there's parts of cities that were extremely healthcare dense. That's where you've got to go. Every major city has one. Philadelphia actually has, has a very large healthcare infrastructure and a university that's you know tied to that healthcare infrastructure. There's your opportunity. Because if any area goes down, it's not going to be that part of that, that city. So, so don't look at cities, look at parts of cities. And we always talk about submarkets, and I know mm -hmm. that you are big on that. You know, it's great to talk about huge MSAs, but mm -hmm give you some gold right here. Focus on those sub markets and specifically understanding the underlying drivers that are yep. going to influence the growth and success. Focusing on kind of those healthcare hubs, powerful tips there to employ. Neil, let's transition just a little bit. You know, just like you, you know, we work with investors and I know that you're talking to investors all day, every day with the different webinars that you're hosting and different trainings. What do you see right now or what are you hearing right now from your investors around the current sentiment about investing in this current foggy climate? I think there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion. Um, investors are not sure if this is like 2008. And in some ways it is. I mean, the commercial markets are more or less frozen up at this point in time. The single family markets don't seem to be. I mean, you're, you're getting all these great cheap loans on the single family side. And obviously there's a reduction in, in volume and, and, uh, and interest, but, but it, the markets are not frozen up. So the investors are, are kind of in this wait and watch mode. That's what we are hearing. And what we are doing is we're preparing the investors to understand, yep, that's the right thing to do. The next 45 days, there's fog. But when the fog lifts, there's going to be some blood uh, in the water. And, you know, if you've been sitting on the sidelines for the last two years saying everything's very expensive, you don't have that excuse anymore. So don't freeze up, right? You're going to get deals. There's, you're going to get small multifamily deals. You're going to get large multifamily deals. Everything's going to be cheaper when we come out of the fog. Everything. And I, I mean everything. I, I don't see any asset class in real estate being at the same price 
uh, 60 days from now as it was in February. Not one. I mean, there's there's nobody that's not going to get touched. Every every asset class will see prices drop. But the message I want to give investors is this. That drop in price is going to be temporary, not like 2009, which was a, a, a you know, it was a liquidity crisis, it was a banking crisis, a real estate crisis. This is none of those. This is a healthcare crisis. And so next year, we find a vaccine, those prices are abruptly going to go back up to where we are. Maybe by the, the middle of next year, you end up essentially at the same prices where you are in Feb. Keep in mind, we did inject a ridiculously large amount of stimulus into the economy, and it, it, it takes six to 12 months to kick in. And so when it kicks in, it actually makes sense for prices to match February or even be higher than February with, with the emphasis, the impact of that stimulus. Um, so, but in the short term, there's going to be blood in the water. So if you're an investor, don't freeze because you've been kicking yourself for the last nine years for freezing in 2009. When I was buying, I was paying $90,000 for four bedroom, you know, beautiful homes. People were telling me I was the biggest idiot in the world, right? Well, that worked out well for me because I didn't freeze. I followed the data and the data showed that it, there was no way to lose. That, I mean, I was telling people there's no way to lose and they were looking at me like I'm the biggest idiot of all time, right? I'm telling you again that in Q3 of this year, you're going to see opportunities. You're going to see syndication opportunities. You're going to see buy for yourself opportunities. You're going to see strip malls selling at 50% off. Buy them because the economy, the underlying economy in February was very strong. And while we've taken a one-year you know, hit the underlying economy a year from now, a year from a uh, half an hour from now is again going to be strong. So we should come back to that Fed price at some point. I don't want to project when, but we're going to come back to that. So if you get 20% off in the second half of the year or 30, why wouldn't you take it? This is, this is a time to move assets around, get some dry powder going and wait for the fog to lift. And I think too, to your point for, current owners, um, those folks who may be interested in selling, to sell right now indicates a couple of things. One is there's a need to sell because most of us who are sophisticated, who own property, we know that, hey, your best bet is to wait until this thing is over before you yeah. list a property or put it on the market. So if they're selling now, they're selling for some other underlying reason. Maybe they're just tapped out. They're just done with it. They, are, they had to chase down rents and it was harder than they've had to work uh, you know, maybe over the last five years or so, maybe they had investors that absolutely need to get out of deal. Maybe they have some financing issues, whatever the point is, the demand is going to drop so you can get better pricing. And by doing that now, you'll be in a much better position a few months from now, right? Or if you know, going into next year, you know, I read a lot of stuff and I'm sure you do as well, Neil, from different investors, different economists and different perspectives. And there seems to be a, you know, a couple different camps out there. Um, one is very negative and pessimistic. And while we don't try to be uh, negative or pessimistic, we certainly want to understand the potential risk or things that we need to pay attention to. For some folks who see this is kind of more of a, a precursor to a larger recession, a more stretched out thing where the underlying um, you know, economic indicators are actually worse than maybe we knew or maybe we anticipated. How do you react to that or how do you respond when you see some of the things that are indicating that now is not the right time to invest and as a matter of fact, we should keep money on the sidelines through the end of the year? Looking at the, the normal ways that we measured the economy, there's no no uh, way that any economist would say that we were weak. We, we've we had corporate profits at record high. We've had corporate cash at record high. We've had bank liquidity at 100 times higher than it was in 2007. Um, the household debt has gone down from 100% to 72%. So that the economy fundamentally, in any way that people know how to measure it, was doing well. So this underlying weakness that people talk about I, I haven't seen any evidence of actual data, okay? Um, are we going to get weaker? Yeah, this, this itself is a massive hit. So the underlying strength of the economy six months from now is not going to be what it was in Feb. That's, that's unavoidable. So I'm gonna say this. I don't think that these people are wrong. I think that these people are making worst case assumptions. And if you read what they're saying and hear what they're talking about as a worst case assumption, they're fine. In my mind, though, the U.S. was very, very slow to react to COVID, but we are still 
the most entrepreneurial, the most exciting country in the world. And now we've put all of our brain brain power, the healthcare geniuses and the technology geniuses and the manufacturing geniuses to work on the problem. And I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I came here from India and I'm always amazed at just when I, when I compare the two countries, there's so many good things about India. But when I see the entrepreneurial strength of America, it has not changed. We will find clever ways to fix this. So the worst case scenario in my mind is simply that it's the worst case scenario. I don't make business decisions based on worst case scenario. I make it based on likely case scenario, right? So that's the edge case. The likely case scenario is we will use technology and tools and systems to get this under some level of control until a vaccine arrives. And then at that point in time, coronavirus will just be a distant memory. We've had horrible things in our past. We've had massive pandemics. We've had everything from Ebola to typhoid that we've killed. Those things are gone forever, right? This will go too. And so I urge people not to listen to edge cases. Something that has a 5% chance of happening is not the basis on which you make business decision. Something that has a 50% chance of happening, yes, use that as your business case, as your best case. Be prudent, be a little bearish if you want to be, but never use worst case to make business decisions. You're never gonna make money and you're probably gonna end up losing money. Neil, as always, great information. Let's move on to our bullseye round. You ready? Ready. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Um, bought a property in Chicago using a future growth premise. I've learned not to do a future growth premise. It was right next to the Obama Presidential Library, which as you know, is delayed for the last four years, still hasn't started construction. The area hasn't gentrified, everyone's still waiting. And I'm still holding onto a property that has a, you know, sub, you know, low level tenant base and, and, you know, very low levels of income and I'm suffering and my investors are suffering. And as a, as a result, what I've learned to do is never buy based on future growth, only buy based on past growth. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Oh, unquestionably, it's the Miracle Morning. And, and the reason for that simply is that the Miracle Morning, if you, if you pursue it, you read it and you use it, it will give you the gift of reading hundreds of other books that you would have never read if you were not on the Miracle Morning. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Well, that's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> a digital or mobile resource. Udemy.com is a phenomenal resource because I think we are all attention deficit at this point. And so I love the fact that there's video-based high quality uh, courses. Most of them are either free or they're 10 bucks. For because, Given that it's mobile enabled, it makes no sense in the world not to go in there and start you know, watching those courses. They, they give you an incredible amount of insight. Give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Um, get up at five in the morning and until 6.30, do nothing except the miracle morning. So once again, I take you back to the miracle morning because it's a set of habits. And, and if you read the books, you, you, you'll see. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? Um, <laughs> um, real estate is the most hype filled uh, market of all time. And I've also shoveled bullshit. So. I came from a data-driven background and I wish I hadn't shoveled bullshit. So that's what I know now, not to shovel bullshit. Just give it to people straight, they can take it. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew just 12 months ago? COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheating. I think, all, I think that's everyone's answer now, right? Uh, yes. all right. What are you curious about right now? Um, I am curious about how the U.S. government is going to do, you know, we started slow. I'm curious about how we're going to do in the next two months. I mean, books will be written on our response to this. We started slow and I, I, I hope, and maybe I'm just smoking hopium, that we don't end up being as slow as we were in the past, that we kind of forge ahead and do some things that the rest of the world copies. So far, all we're doing is copying China and South Korea and, and, and Singapore. I want people to copy what the United States of America did. Neil, where are you located again? 
I'm in San Francisco. On the internet, I live at multifamilyu.com. That's multifamilyu.com. And we do about 50 data-driven webinars a year. I actually do two a week on and something related to coronavirus at this point. All right, you're doing a lot of stuff. So right now, I know you're, you're shut down as well as we are, but maybe by the time this episode comes out, you will be at, you will be able to go out to your favorite restaurant. When that happens, give me the, your favorite place to grab a bite. Oh, there's this place called Port of Peri Peri, which is a, a chicken place that's becoming very popular here in California. So um, I, I like to go out to places that are yummy, but still keep me within my carb budget. So I uh, highly recommend the Port of Peri Peri. There you go. Neil, we've mentioned Multifamily U. Where else can our listeners get in touch with you? So the investors that want to look at investment projects can go to growcapitus.com. That's G-R-O, no W, G-R-O, capitus, C-A-P-I-T-U-S dot com. Another way to get in touch with me very simply is to Google my first and my last name. I happen to be the only Neil Bawa on the World Wide Web. Just remember to type in N-E-A-L Bawa, B-A-W-A not N-E-I-L. So I use the Irish spelling, not the American spelling. There you go. Neil, this has been a lot of fun and very informative um, conversation. One, I uh, really appreciate you breaking down kind of um, the way you saw the the market kind of pre-COVID-19 back in fe- up to February 2020, the way you see us kind of going through this fog right now with headlights and trying to make the best sense of the information today. But more importantly, just the outlook coming out of this, you know, where should we be focusing, where are the opportunities going mm-hmm. to be, and really locking in on kind of those healthcare hubs. Great information for our listeners right there. Uh, Neil, do you have anything else to say before we wrap up today's show? Love to be back in maybe 90 days and look at the wor- the new world because, uh, you know, we're not in the new world yet, right? We're, we're traveling through the fog towards the new world. Love it. Neil, always good to talk to you. Great to see you again. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, John.